Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2022 Anna Boy Memorial Lecture. Welcome to both our guests here in the room, and I know there are some in the overflow space, so welcome to everyone who has joined us here this afternoon. My name is Sheila Riota, and as Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at PC, and also an Associate Professor of Chemistry, I'm especially excited to welcome you all here today, most especially our distinguished speaker and panelists. By way of professional accomplishment and personal example, each of them, and of course, Dr. Jesus Lavoie, exemplifies the quality and impact Providence College's STEM participants. Their stories inspire us, students and faculty alike. Events like today's Lavoie lecture are important to the college. These women serve as wonderful examples of the possibilities open to our students when one uses a Providence College education as a pathway to a career in science. We are especially excited to be bringing these women together as we celebrate the 50th anniversary of the enrollment of the first class of Providence College women. Like the first women undergraduates on our campus, these distinguished guests have faced both successes and challenges. Earlier this year, several of our students, faculty, and staff screened the documentary, Picture a Scientist, which details the extraordinary work of women scientists and the challenges they have experienced and continue to face. We have invited these women to campus to share their stories, as well as reflections on creating greater equity in the STEM field. Before we begin the presentation and panel discussion, I would like to invite Father Kenneth Sitar, Father's College 13th President, to bring greetings from the college leadership and our Dominican community. While we celebrated Father's formal inauguration this past October, he has actually been on the job since July 1st of 2020, following 15 years as executive vice president. Despite the immense challenges during this time, Father has guided the college with a steady hand, earning praise from all the constituencies that care deeply about PC and its future. In his many years in leadership at his alma mater, Father Sakar has been a strong advocate for the sciences, and his support of this initiative is appreciated. Please join me in welcoming Father Sakar. Thank you, Dr. Leota, and please let me express my appreciation for all those who worked so hard to organize this wonderful presentation. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you today. And it's particularly fitting that we celebrate PC Women and the Sciences today, February 11th, a day chosen by the United Nations as International Women and Girls in Science Day. As we celebrate all that has been accomplished, we also recognize there is much work to be done in ensuring greater equity in STEM fields. I would also like to extend my personal thanks to Dr. Teresa Lavoie for establishing this lectureship and tribute to her mother, Anna, as a means for encouraging our students to consider a wide array of career paths. Additionally, Teresa has established the Gilbert V. Lavoie Science and Business Fellowship Fund in honor of her father, who will be here tonight, right? That <laughs> stuck in traffic? Yes. <laughs> the Lavoie Fellowship provides annual summer internships for students who are combining their interests in science and business. As a college trustee, Teresa has continued to offer her leadership and support to PC and she currently serves on the academic subcommittee of the then, now, next 50 years of women at PC celebration. Teresa, we are so grateful for all you do for college. It is now my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Leona, who will introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Beninato. Thank you. It is now my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Carrie Beninato. Carrie received her Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry from Providence College, and a few of us in the room had the pleasure to work with her when she was here as a student. After that, she moved to Boston College, where she obtained her PhD, working in the labs of Amir Poveda, 
focusing on copper catalyzed manzio selective allylic substitution reaction. I've seen that. <laughs> Following that, she worked in the labs of Max Scher at Harvard University as a National Institute of Health postdoctoral fellow. After her postdoc, she joined AstraZeneca Pharmaceuticals, where she worked in the infectious diseases group, focusing on the identification of new therapies for gram negative infections. After seven years at AstraZeneca, she moved to Moderna, where she was the founding member of the platform delivery chemistry team, which aims to identify novel lipid nanoparticle components for the delivery of messenger RNA therapies. Currently, Carrie is vice president of platform delivery, responsible for the discovery chemistry, pre-formulation, and formulation discovery teams. Since joining Moderna, she has led the discovery of multiple novel delivery vehicles and have progressed them into human clinical trials for a range of indications. Carrie is an inventor on over 20 United States patents, including sole inventor on one of the patents covering mRNA 1273, Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. One quick programming note, following Dr. Peninato's presentation, we will begin the moderated panel, and the Q&A session will follow, follow that panel session. But I am now pleased and please join me in welcoming Dr. Kerry Beninato back to Providence College. So thank you so much, Dr. Kiora. I, you know, to me, she always will be Dr. Adams. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, the fact that my journey and what, what it is I've done, it's, this is just what I've been doing. This is what I wanted to learn, but the fact that the story that people, that people want to hear. And so, you know, going all the way back to the beginning, like people have also often ask me, like, when did you know you wanted to be a parent? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> um, I, you know, early on, I grew up in Somerset, Massachusetts, which is about 20, 25 minutes that way, probably a lot longer with the traffic these days. You know, science wasn't in my family. I never had a chemistry set, but I was a perfectionist. And I think I just wanted to, I wanted to do something important. I didn't know what that was, but I wanted to do something important. In high school, so we'll start with the early education. In high school, I was, I was an overachiever. I was a perfectionist, you know, I wanted to do well. Um, and I think early in my career, I was told that I wasn't good enough. So I was never going to be an A student in biology. I was never going to be an A student in math. I should drop that. So instead, I had a math particle science college. <laughs> and, you know, and I got an A in biology. <laughs> and so come my senior year, um, taking all the AP, the AP courses, I was really going back and forth between the sciences, chemistry, and history. You know, over to your pre law, pre med, which one, you know, which one do I want to do? And I really don't, I've been, I've been reflecting over this in you know, the past few days. I don't remember what it was about the chemistry that really made me go that way. I think I had this um, teacher, uh, Mr. Chauvet. And so our AP chemistry class, there were four students in the class, um, two women and two men. And Mr. Chauvet started to introduce us to molecular orbital theory and organic chemistry. And I said, ah, I'm like, okay, that's the, that, that's the direction I want to go. And so when it came to if, uh, thinking about schools, you know, where I ended up, and really the decision to come here was really because it was comfortable. You know, I was a little nervous about going away to school. I'm, sh I'm a shy person. Uh, I tend to be very quiet. And I come from a long line of college alumni, so my family's been over here. So my father was... Uh, class of 1970, so the last class before they had like, <laughs> 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 we were class of 93 and class of class of 95. And, and, and so was like business, uh, humanities, and sociology. Social science. Social science. <laughs> so, no, like, no science. <laughs> And so when I so when I joined um, Providence College and there were eight chemistry majors I think I think in our class and I think it was actually 50 50 um, on the women and men it was a pretty tight knit group you know the work at the school was hard it was you know overwhelming I you know when I talk 
on my junior year, I recognized that I struggled with, with depression. And so it's something that, that I had to learn how to deal with. However, the community, and especially I think just in the chemistry community, not this building, but the building over there, spent a lot of time there. And it just, it was comfortable. And I think that's a really important thing for me is to feel, it's all about the environment to feel, to feel comfortable. So sophomore year took organic and, you know, loved it. But I started getting a little nervous because after Jenny's time in Argo, I really hated lab. And it's just, you know, I'm like, okay, well, why do I want to be a chemist? And mm -hmm. I did say in the lab. So I actually changed my major to chemical engineering. And then come at the end, uh, the end of the semester when it was time to register for classes, I realized I couldn't take any more chemistry classes. And I and just was like, okay, I think this is not great. Right. Um, so I and so it was that time, that sophomore year, that summer, where I get my first experience in what actual research is and veg science is about with Dr. Yoke's lab. I spent the summer there. Um, something about adamantium, <laughs> I think that's where my, memory, where my memory is, but I remember the summer, my mother will, I'm sure, will tell her, everyone the story about how we moved to a new house. And I was like, mom, this house is moss. It's also made all these holes. <laughs> and so come my senior, uh, my uh, the summer of my junior year, I had the opportunity to do a research experience for undergraduates on an RU at Columbia. And that was really where I made the decision, like I definitely want to go to graduate school. It was my first exposure to you know a big university with a lot of graduate students. And um, the project I worked on was I was here in gels all summer. Um, it was it was just a really engaging environment. I knew that was just what I wanted to do. And so I went, um, started, I applied to a bunch of graduate schools and, you know, I, I, I visited them. But Boston College, there was something about it where the professors seemed very engaged. They seemed um, very approachable. And, and I was able to meet one of their, their graduate students, Kevin Kuntz, who I'm still, who I'm still friends with today. And he was just so passionate about his science and what he was doing. And it just really, it really drew me up. And so, I'll, and I will say there's another decision to stay in Boston. This might be a much shorter. And so, when I went to DC, I was so overwhelmed. So, I'm now I'm in this class, a lot of talented people that are coming from these really big research schools and university schools. And, you know, I just was overwhelmed. Like, oh, I don't know what I'm getting, I don't know what I'm getting myself into. You know, the big decision that I had to make was who am I going to work for? And so I remember we went to, um, it was my first mechanistic or organic chemistry class, and Amir Hobeda was his professor. I hadn't met him, so I didn't meet him when I visited the school because he was traveling, and then he had been traveling when, when, when the class started. And he came in, and he started in his chalkboards, but he started on one side of the, chalk, the chalkboard and just started going. And, Drawing chemistry and just the way he talked and he engaged and, and, and taught was just, I was like, I, I have to work for this person. You know, the challenge is, is that it's really scary. <laughs> <laughs> so I, he accepted me into his lab and, you know, five years, you know, here's a, a five years going. So working on my thesis, it was, it was very hard. Amir was a very dynamic person. Um, I, I think I'm still, I still get nervous sending an email. I'll get that. Um, but we had such an amazing lab, the community of people in lab, and I think that's kind of the thing is that I found a really good environment where I had that support network. And so, though, you know, things were challenging. I worked with a lot of men that I was an easy target to make look bad or put down, and I just took it because I knew, like, I wasn't going to speak up and say, say anything. There's a lot of time in the third stall of the ones back in graduate school. However, I, I made it through. And then the decision is do I go to industry or do I do postdoc? And so, who I am, I knew I would always second guess and feel inferior if I didn't do a postdoc. You, to, you don't go back and do a postdoc. You know, I'm kind of, uh, I'm move into an industry position. And there's another aspect is that I knew the close group of friends that we were all graduating together. And the thought of being in competition with them to the same positions was just not something that, that I wanted to do. And so I went to Harvard, I was there for two years. Um, and it was, it was, it was fine. It was two years. It was a small lab. It was all men when I started. Um, 
I think there was only eight people. And I just went in and put my head down and did my work, um, you know, was able to get a publication out of it. But it was one of the most um, engaging time. But it did give me time to kind of, you know, recollect myself after five years of working for a mirror, which is something I can do. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the next piece was how I ended up at Hashi's Anathar. And so I um, basically, the way, you know, the thing about the community, the thing about a mirror, and he's a lovely person, I want to say, um, that he wants to be a horrible partner, is that if you do the work, then he's going to do the work for you. And so one of his previous graduate students had an opening for a science uh, position. So he called the mayor, said, Who do you have? He's like, You want her? So he reached out to me, I interviewed, and I joined AstraZeneca. I also had two very good friends that were in graduate school with me who were there as well. So you know, I was like, it felt like it felt like like the right choice. I remember, you know, when I interviewed, so I asked them, so what what does he actually do? Like, so I'm I'm gonna be a chemist, I'm going to industry. I still have no idea really what he did. Like, what did that mean to be a chemist in industry? What did it mean to be a medicinal chemist? You know, sit, sitting across the table from my from my boss Mike, and you know, when I first started, please tell me, tell me about, about the projects and one of the projects. <laughs> so all these you know factors and clearance and things i'm like okay do i want to see a big number or a little number <laughs> and, and, and we'll start but i did well i did well at astrazeneca you know i was you know i i got uh, I promoted a couple times to principal scientist that's where i started my family i was a little nervous because each time i got promoted i was pregnant so <laughs> I, to my house, I'm like, I hope this isn't just stealing my career <laughs> you know we're we're, we're going to be we're going to be in trouble but then after seven years, there's a lot going on at AstraZeneca, and it was a good time for me. I just I wanted to make a change. It's you know, working in antibacterials, it's, it's a very important space, but it's a very niche space. It's very specific to biology. It hadn't worked on some of the targets, and for me, it was it was that learning piece. And it was also it's a really really complicated, like challenging field, and so really you're still having to work with you know nothing new is working. And so I was working on a program. That was based on beta lactam, so penicillin based compounds. And this is you know, back in 2014. It was really hard to get up. I remember being like, I'm so excited because I put that methyl there and it's very potent on compounds that have been around for 35, 40 years. And so then that's where I'm with Dern came. So joining Moderna was, you know, it was, I didn't realize I was going to make a big change. And that's really what it ended up being. The fact that I, Talking about delivery and the nanoparticles, I, I knew nothing about RNA or lipids or delivery or any of this. But I met the person that would be my boss, and we were to put it off. And just the potential of the technology, right? You, you deliver RNA, and it's gonna your body's gonna cure it. Cure, cure. So either for, um, you know, they weren't even talking about vaccines, honestly, when started. So, but you know, for rare disease, right? Just replace that one enzyme. Replace that one enzyme. And then the challenge that was posed to me is, well, you have to be able to deliver the RNA. So you need something to protect it for it to actually be able to get to it and do what it wants to do. The problem is it's the state of the art. L and P's just weren't toxic enough. They both, you know, they were toxic. So they weren't safe and they just weren't as as cool. And so my job was, okay, let's, you know, we're going to invest in this. And that's what I was asked to do. And so that's what I've done. So long story, long story short, um, it worked. <laughs> um, and it was a really, it was a really crazy year at, at, at Moderna. So, you know, I'll take take one step back in terms of, you know, another reason why I ended up there was because of my previous boss at AstraZeneca. It wasn't because of his support; it was kind of because of his lack of support. In that, I remember um, there was a lot going on, and, and I had been told by many Pangos, uh, actually now Sir Mene. Who is like the, basically the CSO of AstraZeneca? You're safe. This change is happening, but don't worry, you're going to have a job. I said, okay. And then my boss told me, you know, you're never safe, forget about it, you should be applying to every single job under the sun. So the job I applied to is actually a senior scientist position, and I was already, you know, a, a couple of levels above that. And so, you know, I think as a woman, I think we tend to do this is, you know, when you really change jobs, you're supposed to go up levels, get promotion, and I actually made a lateral move. But it worked out. Um, I've been, Moderna has been very, very good for me. 
I've obviously I've moved up the ladder. I've got promoted. I've got a lot of more responsibilities. I got and I can and got to do a lot of great things. And you know, and then COVID happened, and like wow, it was, <laughs> it was amazing. You know, I I had done my job like you know how many years ago, but I remember the day that the efficacy data like came out and the phase one and said like ninety five to something like that. You know, I start crying. Wow, and I'm still shaking to this day. It's just very, it's just so overwhelming. I'm so proud to be a part of it. And so over the course of the year and over the course of my career, it hasn't been easy. You know, I am who I am. I beat myself up, I'm a perfectionist, I'm a work critic. And so, you know, I think some of the challenges that I have to deal with is one is myself, I think. And then also the environment. Like when you're not in the right environment, you need to be able to, as, as you need to be able to handle it. You know, when I was working at BC, Amir had his favorites. You know, he they were the ones he was always talking to. And I was assuming that it was supposed to be really important. After the fact, I realized it's because he didn't have to worry about it. So he knew I was doing the right things and making the right decisions, but you don't really think about that at the, at, at the time. At, at AstraZeneca, as you know, I'm getting my mentorship from my managers about how to grow up in the ladder and to how to be, you know, become a leader. Well, you're going to have to change because there's a lot of loud voices and new people in the room, and you're going to have to change to be able to manage them versus they're the ones that have to be there. They're the ones that have to change. You know, I mentioned to my boss that I ended up at I, I ended up at with the journal, which was the best career change I I I, I could that. But he just wasn't very supportive. And I think just in, in, like in general, I remember ratings, compensation, you know, compensation ratings, end of year, who's gonna get a bonus, you know, what bonus level. And someone had been on maternity leave, and one of the men in the department, well, they should just get a free because they weren't here already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Like, and that was just, that was, you know, that was the mentality. You know, at Moderna, it's an insane place. It's super crazy. It's why the company was able to do what it was able to do. You know, but it's still, it's still, it's a boys club. It still is. And this great relationship I had with my mentors and people like my managers, it was still, you know, I still kind of felt on, like felt on the outside. And that was the first time where I remember driving into work and I was, oh man, I, I've driven to work in tears multiple times. Do you know those call my dad? Like, what am I doing? And it, and it started to make me realize like why a lot of women maybe do transition away from the hard sciences and go into and stay involved in, in, in the industry, but kind of move away because it's hard. It's just this constant, you're having, you're having to fight, you're having to beat your head and really, you know, learning how to influence. And what's gotten me through is that I love, I love what I do. Like, I love what I do. And I'm finally at that point in my career where, okay, I'm actually good at it. <laughs> I know that. Um, you know, I learned the leap of people that are telling you things. I think that's the you know that's the piece is you have the support network and you really need to and you really need to um, unbelieve you know uh, believe what they're saying and so i think over the, the course of my career it's really been those people where i don't think of it at the time but they've got me through so dr Miyota is definitely one uh, uh dr tausal um in the math department he convinced me to be a math minor he's like yes help this what is this and it was fun, but he had the faith in me that, that I could that I could do it. In fact, I took it by myself. I think it was to do with PCAM. I took an independent study, and, but, I, but I was able to do it. And, and, and he was right. In graduate school, it was my it was my classmates, it was my junior classmates, the people that looked up to me, that uh, you know wanted my advice, and I'm still very very good friends with them um, to, uh, to to this day. And then in industry, it's been it's been my managers. I've had some wonderful. At Moderna, uh, Stephen, the president, and Stefan, the CEO, they have over the years taken the time to spend time with me and just really, you know, do what they can to really um, help me out. So I think, you know, advice to, you know, people thinking about, you know, are, are just struggling where, wherever you are, is don't listen to the inner monologue unless it's telling you you're awesome because it's not. <laughs> and, and that's hard, but the more you do it, and I still do it too today, but it's just, it's a really, it's a really Thing. If you find yourself, the environment is so important. So if you're not in the environment, it doesn't feel right. Like there's something else you need to, right? You need to get out of it because that's 
you know, if it, it almost doesn't matter what I'm doing, as long as I'm surrounded by great people and people who are passionate. You know, I think that's the other piece that I love. I, I'll say it again. Anyway, I am very, very passionate about what I do. I love what I do. And, you know, into, into this day, and this is where, well, you know, for my career, like, this is what I want to do. I want to stay in the, in the, in the sciences and touching the science. And so I'll close with, you know, where um, Providence College kind of sits in all of this. And so, you know, having a liberal arts education, when I started at Boston College, I was like, oh no, I'm making wrong choice in going to undergrad because I'm so behind everybody else. And that wasn't true, but just things they were talking about because they just been exposed to different, you know, different things like being at a big a, a, a graduate school. And so just really, you know, it was something that again, beating myself up, you know, up, up about, but you know, now that I stand up here, it was the best place for me because it was small and it was supportive and it was really comfortable. And then, you know, and I'll finish with SIP as much as <laughs> <laughs> you know, I remember my first, I was in the honors program, I, I got a D on my first paper. I was like, I don't get it. <laughs> but you learn how to communicate again at a liberal arts school. You learn how to communicate, you learn how to write. And I have to tell you, when I have to proofread, you know, people, you know, as a scientist, you have to write, you have to write publication, and I'm trying to proofread things for people that didn't have this type of background. And it's painful. <laughs> and it's just something that I never appreciated until, um, you know, I'm, I'm, until, I'm, until I'm in this position. And then I also think it really helps you be a leader because you have such a broad education. You learn a lot. You learn how to interact with people. And, you know, I had a, one of my, I was telling my husband yesterday, like I had one of my direct reports basically tell me that I was the best person he's ever worked with, the best manager. In fact, his wife at home is like, I need a carry. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I think it's because of the education that, you know, that you get here and that you're interacting with so many different people like across the world. And so I will, you know, thank thank everyone again for inviting me. This has been wonderful. Hopefully, you know, you like some of what I have to say about my story. And so thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Bernardo for sharing your story. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, can we just ask the panelists and moder moderators to come to their tables for discussion? Hey. Welcome panelists and my fellow moderators, and thank you everyone for coming to today's event to celebrate women's STEM at Providence College. My name is Grace Holtz. I am a junior in biology and woman and gender studies, woman and gender studies double major, and I am honored to be in a room right now with so many amazing women scientists. My name is Ali Zaleka. I'm a senior biology major with a woman and gender studies minor. My name is Dominique Polanco. I'm a junior as well. I'm in the engineering program. I'm a physics major and a math writer. Everybody is me. Now I'll introduce the panelists. So we have uh, Carrie Beninato, PhD, class of 99. Um, Shelly McBride, DMD, class of 89. Pediatric dentist at Chestnut Dental. And Sarah Kane. Class of 19, Associate Transmission Line Engineer, National Grid. And Car Dr. Carol Kratz, PhD, former Associate Professor of Biology, Hawkins College. And if you want to go down the line and say two to four sentences about yourselves and connection to PC. Okay. When I came to PC, I um, came straight from graduate school and just kind of lucked into a job part-time job um, running the general biology labs. And then I was offered an instructorship the following year and said, well, wait a minute, I'm qualified for assistant professor, tenure track. And she said, oh yeah, okay. So there you go. Um, I was here for 41 years. 
a lot of my former students are here, including Shelly. <laughs> um, I am now retired. I retired in 2014. But I served as, I was the first woman in the sciences. It's the only woman in the sciences um, on the faculty and um, eventually served as department chair, dean's office, associate dean for a number of years, 10 years, I think. Um, the health professions advisor. So I, I did a lot of things. <laughs> Caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Kane. I am from the class of 2019. Um, I was, I did the engineering program, so I was at PC for three years, um, and then I went to Columbia University and got another bachelor's in civil engineering, and now I'm currently working at National Grid, while also um, getting my MBA at Boston College. <laughs> I'm Shelly McBride, uh, class of PC 1989, hard to believe that I came here 37 years ago, <laughs> Um, after PC, decided to go into the dental profession and the pediatric dentist and practice called Chestnut Dental Associates in Massachusetts. We have three locations now. I went to University of Connecticut Dental School and uh, for my DMD, and then Children's Hospital Boston Harvard University, specialized in pediatrics. And uh, I've loved each step of the way. I think that's why I'm here. <laughs> and I thank um, PC for helping steer me. Um, so, could you guys just share your experiences at PC regarding gender balance in the classroom and how it may have impacted your experience? <laughs> <laughs> okay, in prepping for the panel, one of the questions that we were asked to answer was. Were there any specific instructors or Dominican friars that influenced you? And Dr. Kraft came to mind immediately. She was the pre dental and pre medical advisor. So she really helped us all get into graduate programs. And Dr. Mark Noll came to mind because his histopathology class is um, one that was up there as one of most of our favorites. But I couldn't remember his last name. So I had to go. Open Sometimes I can't. <laughs> it was probably Mark. Awesome. Um, but I couldn't remember the last name, so I opened up the yearbook and I happened to open and look at the science page, which was the chemistry, biology, and physics department. And it's interesting. I shared it with Dr. Kraft. There's 19 ed, you know, professors on this page, and two of them are women, and one of them was a lab tech. So she was it. <laughs> um, and we didn't, but it, it didn't. When I came here 14 years after school and became co ed, um, it, we were 50 50. Our class was 50 50. And most of my blood has been 50 50. So it didn't ever feel like there's any bias problem except for our instructors. They were primarily male in the FPC. And um, in dental school, and even in culture. So that's changing. But it wasn't, that's the way it was. Um, for me, it was a little different. Um, for the engineering program here, it was about one third girls, which is better because when I went to Columbia, it was about 20% girls, 80% you know, bad males. So, I mean, regarding being in the classroom with you know mainly males i went to an all-girls catholic high school so i never saw competition in the classroom like i never gendered it so when i was in this position you know where i was you know one of the few females it didn't really bother me and i know that's not the case for a lot of people but i was just lucky enough to have that experience um but i mean i guess one thing that did bother me <laughs> was um you know at providence where we created all these study groups or you know I helped create all these study groups. And sometimes when I would give an answer, one of the males in the group wouldn't accept my answer. He would have to hear another male in the group <laughs> say, oh yeah, she's right. Or, oh yeah, it is this, this answer. <clears throat> Fully that went away, but you know, I really had to prove myself quote unquote a lot. Uh, and that was unfortunate, but it you know, wasn't the worst thing in the world. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
I was going to share with you something that was written before the college became co-ed. And it comes from an interview of one of the vice presidents at the time. And it was called, When the Girls Come. Just a little, just a little bit, just a little, 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 little. And one of, the, one of the things he said, and this was in 1970, equal but different sums it up. Because a woman's mind works differently than a man's, she is often thought to be less rational. Hence the dumb, broad stereotype. Actually, she is merely rational in a different way. A woman's intellectual interests are largely utilitarian and rooted in concrete reality. A woman is not very interested in the causes of things. Tell that, <laughs> tell that to a scientist. Okay? <laughs> I was struck by some of the things that Carrie mentioned. And I think um, women have to put up with a lot of uh, resistance to suggestions, recommendations, process, and so on and so forth. I do recall walking down the sidewalk towards Slavin Center one day and a gentleman from, and I use that term loosely, from the business department came over and said, how can, how can you be so attractive and so smart at the same time? <laughs> and now I, I sort of laugh thinking back, I keep track of a lot of my students on Facebook and I have one who is also a pediatric dentist. She also happens to be a cheerleader for the Patriots. She's gorgeous, <laughs> smart, gorgeous, all at the same time, it's fine. I also had conversations with students. I had a couple of lab assistants. Um, one was a young woman and one was a young man. And we were talking about the women at the college and he thought it was great that they were here, but he didn't like the fact that they had equal time on the ice because it kept his, his ice hockey team off the ice and it was just interrupting everything the way it should. <laughs> so, there, were, there were a lot of little nuanced um, difficulties. I think that um, a lot of that has gone by and I was talking to a young man, not so young actually, he's retired now, but he was, he was in my first general biology laboratory class. He lives across the road from me. Turns out his, his daughter was also one of my students. Um, and he said, you know, the fact that Providence College went co-ed is probably the best thing they ever did. So there you go. It's true. It's changed. Um, Carrie, specifically for you, you did mention something about feeling like sometimes you felt like there was a boy, a boys club environment. However, how do you see the industry and profession that you are in now kind of make advances as it relates to gender equity? And this is also open to the other campus. Okay. Yes and no. I think part of the reason why I've been able to grow up with them is the fact that the, the senior years recognize that different voices and different styles is, is a good thing. Right, and so I think just in general within the industry here, it's a lot of conversation about inclusion and the fact that diversity across the board is important. There's been so many studies on you know the, the top innovative companies, the ones that have been the most successful, it's the ones that are 50-50 on their board, you know, it's the one that have the most diverse um, you know leadership teams because you're bringing different perspectives to women, men. And have very different perspectives in the styles as well. And so when I'm in a senior leadership meeting and I look around the table, no, there's not a number, but my past two bosses have both been women. And so on the list that and and um so now that's what you see like the ball of these like the banner. And so you know it's getting there, but I think it's my the concern is, is I it started 50-50. My graduate, I think my in the nearest class for a good portion, his lab is 30 something, it's mostly women actually, but but it goes away. And so I think it's like, how do we create the, the, my, the environment to be conducive, to allow people to go, to allow people to be, you know, to be themselves. And then for Sarah, kind of going off of your last point, but for Sarah, what more do you think um, can be done to encourage women, especially women of color, to enter the sciences and pride. That's a little question. <laughs> um, I want to word this correctly because you know, it is such a loaded question. But um, as far as you know, just people of color in general. Um, actually, my class 
So in my engineering class, we had the we were the most diverse in the class of 2019, which I am very proud of. Um, however, um, PC is generally not that. I definitely think we need to work on our diversity um, at the college. I know specifically for me in my I was in the honors program. Um, and when I would go to my honors classes, I was the only person of color in the room. So that definitely just needs, as a whole, needs to be worked on. And then as far as, you know, helping women uh, of color in, in the field thrive, I think that's a very difficult question just because to be, and to be a scientist, you have to love what you do and you can't force that on someone and you can't force, you know, the hours that you spend in the classroom on someone that just doesn't love it. So uh, I'm not, honestly, I'm not really sure how, but I don't, that's just, you know, at the end of the day, PC can only do so much to, you know, push, push women of color and just women um, to, to be an engineer or a scientist or whatever, because at the end of the day, it's, it's the person themselves that has to push themselves, which in my opinion. And again, you can't force that on a person. <laughs> Um, and then Shelly and for the rest of the panel, um, please share your experiences as a woman scientist um, and then what successes and challenges have you faced? I think you either have a science brain or you don't have science brain. <laughs> I have a 15 year old daughter and my husband has a science brain and I have a science brain and she has professed to us already that she felt. <laughs> so um, I think it's what what you love, what how, how your brain works, um, what you enjoy, what challenges you. Um, I think um, it's a little bit as a woman in the science field, in my case in healthcare, um, and as a partner and spouse and parent, um, there's a work-life balance challenge that's forever there. <clears throat> and um, one of the things you need to realize is don't be afraid to ask for help because nobody can do it alone. And um, I think finding career choices with flexibility is important. Um, for me personally, if you think of the dentists that you know, it would have been very difficult for me probably too difficult for me to go and open Dr. McBride's solo practitioner office. So I actually sought out a group practice where I would have the support of partners first to mentor me and then to become my equal business partners. So um, some of the things to look for are avenues that make your career choices make sense. One more. <laughs> yeah. So, um, for Dr. Calcrafts, have you had any? You have a unique perspective as a faculty member and administrator, um, in that you started your distinguished and diverse career at PC when the first class of women undergraduates were here. and retired several years later. What changes did you see, and what are you most proud of? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of changes. I. I was counting the number of women on the science faculty the other day, and it's, it's pushing half, it's pushing 50. <clears throat> Obviously, I was one of you know, 20 when I first arrived at the campus. Um, I was also struck by something that Carrie said about uh, perfectionism, the whole notion of being, you have to be a perfectionist. I think um, there is a tendency and this is actually borne out by the literature, there's a tendency for women to be uh, more perfectionist and, let, and more cautious about uh, their research, when they're gonna publish and so on and so forth. And I was fortunate to be doing a research project with Jack Costello and um, said, well, I, you know, I finished this project, I think, I, I think I probably still need to do a little bit more to just sort of tidy it up. And he said, no, it's ready to go. And I said, Women don't publish as quickly as men, and you got to get over that just too. So I think one of the things that um, women students need is to be encouraged and prodded and 
understand that they are doing exactly the right thing, keep pushing. Um, I think they need some role models. I had a student come in, actually a student of color, actually um, a Vietnamese student come in and say, well, I, you know, I don't really think I can do the pre-med and pre-dental and so on and so forth. Well, she just got um, honorably discharged from the army where she has served as a dentist and she's been fine. And I said, you can do this. She, you, the women students really need to hear that. They need to hear it from men and women on the faculty. Um, mentors are wonderful. I keep track of my, um, my former students on Facebook. A lot of them let me know what they're up to. They all got families and this and that, the other thing. And it's always a pleasure to know that something I have done as one of their teachers has, um, has had an impact. Now, I have a son who lives down in St. John in the Virgin Islands, and I was down there visiting one time. We were sitting on the beach at Francis Bay, kind of back under the sea grapes. And um, one of my former students in my tropical biology class was walking by, and he <laughs> heard me talking. I didn't really see him, heard me talking. He came back, he said, Dr. Krauss, is that you? <laughs> I said, yeah, Jim, oh my God. So we started talking. I said, what are you doing down here? See, well, actually, I was walking down to look at the rocks because I wanted to check. And he had the list from my tropical biology <laughs> to see what the mollusks were on the rocks. So he could show his daughter, who was 10. So those kinds of things really come back to me. And um, it's part of why I love teaching. I liked teaching because I could you know, I, I wanted students to know that a lot of what I was teaching was because I wanted to learn new stuff. So I developed new courses, you know, symbiosis and photobiology and um, you name it. Uh, tropical biology was one of my loves. And actually, I think I taught that because I had a woman professor in biology who taught the tropical biology course. So when I came to PCA, I said, I'm going to put this together. We're going to have a course like that. And um, it was wonderful. And we have a couple people here in the, in the audience who are now teaching that course and they're taking people to different places. Um, and it's a way of learning not just the biology of the area, but about different groups of people and so on and so forth. So uh, all of that. I also wanted um, to work a lot with faculty. I worked on the faculty senate, but um, I found that I enjoy advising the pre-med advising and advising my students. And that's very much like it really is teaching in a form. So um, I got involved in the Dean's office. I was associate Dean for quite a few years, <laughs> 10 actually, I think. Um, and we started an academic advising program to get faculty to use different resources and so on and so forth. And uh, I found that that was, that was very satisfying to me. I loved it here. I always had some mentors. Father Mark was one of them. Um, I was not a Catholic. I am not a Catholic. I knew nothing about the Catholic Church when I came to PC, and I wondered why all these guys were running around in white dresses. <laughs> but um, if I had a question about something, related to the Catholic nature of the college. I always had somebody I could go to. We had some very engaging and interesting and lively conversations. <laughs> <laughs> I had mentors too. <laughs> All right, so panelists, thank you so much for this great discussion. And now we are gonna open it up for a general question. Ask a question of Dr. McBride. You, you mentioned uh, your conversation with your daughter that she doesn't have a science brain. And as a, a dad of four daughters, uh, that bothers me. Uh, do you, how much of it is the daughter doesn't have a science brain or she's been told by somebody that she hasn't doesn't have a science brain? Like one of her three brothers, which is a situation <laughs> in, my, in my family. <laughs> She's an only child, so, uh, so I can't blame a sibling. Um, she loves the English language. She is a gifted writer and has a vocabulary better than my husband and I have had since she was about 10. 
So I think she just realizes what her strengths are. I don't think she feels that she's incapable of having science school. I just think um, she's struggling a little bit in chemistry right now. <laughs> 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 um, and she's thriving in her history and English classes. So as a 15 year old, I think she's making herself realize, you know, her avenue. But you know, you know, kids, they could, she could end up anywhere as a chemistry major like that to choose. So. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? Could I, could I comment on that? When I went to college, I, I did have some science background and I liked science, but I went thinking I was going to major in languages and political science. I had planned to translate at the UN for a few years and then join the Foreign Service. <laughs> and then I took a biology course and that was the end of that. So, you know, they change their minds all the time. I can't take my mask off. Sorry, I'm sorry for COVID. Thank you, everybody. I was actually one of the people who worked with Teresa to, to play this. Thank you, everyone, for came and thank you all of our moderators for doing a job. For my students, I'm a, I'm a PC professor here, and and as we've heard, you know, so many of our female students are perfectionists. They they strive to never have to have that fail. Can you tell us about a moment when you perhaps heard something a little bad, didn't do as well as you wanted to, and how you? from that as a kind of way to help our students. Uh, yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, so at PC, I was again, I was a perfectionist. I, I ended, up, ended up getting the highest GPA in my uh, in the engineering class. Um, and when I went to Columbia, that was a real smack in the face, <laughs> to be quite honest. Um, I have never been more challenged uh, switching over to Columbia, then that was just my first big, you know, school challenge. Um, and it really had had me facing, did I like, do, do I even like science anymore? And I never had that question at PC, never. Um, and, you know, I slowly had to learn, you know, how they did it at Columbia was, you know, everyone failed your exam. My, that was, <laughs> I got a 42 on my exam, and let me tell you, I never got anything below <laughs> a 90 here. <laughs> uh, so that was a shocker. But you know, the class average at Columbia was a 45. So you know, in relation, I did pretty good. Um, <laughs> but you know, for me to bounce back from that, I just had to you know really push myself and see: Did do I love science? Do I want to learn what I'm learning? And you know, did I like science at PC just because I was good at it? Or do I like, like science because it's something that, you know, I wake up and want to learn more and it drives me. And so I think that that's the question that, you know, that that's what kind of changed me. So instead of, you know, studying to get a grade, I started studying to learn. And uh, that's kind of what helped, helped me, you know, with, with, with that situation. But I ended up graduating, you know, so I'm just fine. <laughs> Uh, something that I, you know, tell my, you know, junior team members, same thing, they said this to someone recently, you're, one, you're never going to do that again, because it happened, and so you turn, you know, how do you turn things that you think is a failure or a mistake, you turn it to learn and, you know, just, in, you know, in my career, just, you know, past my, my career years, and I was like, oh, I did a lot of it's hard, and you beat yourself up, but, I finally recognized that when you do this really important study, animal study, and it turns out, ah, that it actually works, you know, these monkeys are acting like the monsters. It's it's fascinating. It, it means you have an opportunity to learn. And those are not that I want our biggest learners to fail, but those are the opportunities where I actually have some of the most powerful and engaging conversations with my students and my colleagues because we have to figure it out. Right. And so, you know, you can always take those things and actually end up making the science better. And I think it makes us better in our relationship. I, I want to comment on that. My, I, I was told by my eighth grade math teacher that girls can't do math, so I shouldn't worry about how to <laughs> And I avoided math literally as much as I possibly could. I got through college, I majored in biology and never took calculus. I didn't want to take calculus. I was terrified. I got to graduate school and my thesis advisor said, of course you have to take math. Of course you have to take calculus. 
So I got into a calculus class with, I don't know, 200 other students in this huge class at Virginia University. And I discovered I loved it. And I listened to this guy, I believed it. I think we have to catch those Catch students before that takes hold. I'm not quite sure how you do it. You need to be encouraged to go ahead and keep at it, keep trying. You're going to get there. I really want to. Dr. Uh, Benedetta, I'm sorry, I can't read your name. <laughs> Did they introduce you saying that you uh, invented the cure for COVID? <laughs> <laughs> One day I had an idea and I drew a molecule on a piece of paper and that molecule is based, the basis of what it looks like. So. <laughs> so I was wondering how you've been able to balance your work life with your family life, particularly since um, Women are the ones who have the children, and in some cases, uh, you know, have the bulk of responsibility. And I'm just wondering if you could reflect on that in terms of the help you've got either uh, in your job or at home. And how, how do you balance this? So I'll start in that I have, you know, I've always had a support family, but I have a support husband. Um, in that, you know, all through graduate school and my postdoc and working at AstraZeneca, you know, we figured out when we were young, we didn't have kids, you know, and so it was just, you know, working long hours, I'll meet you at the bar, you know, and I don't want to I think then once we had, once we had kids, it, and especially once we had our second Henry, it's that thought of, okay, two kids in daycare, and at the time, you know, but, but just wasn't passionate about what he was doing. And so at that point, we made that decision that, that he actually decided to stay home and support the family and take care of the kids and to do all of that because he recognized, I, you know, I'm going to go someplace that he had faith in me. And I think that's a big, a major reason about why I've been able to do this and do the hours and do what I have to do because there's so much you don't have to worry about. And so there's, you know, it's an interesting though reverse where you think about, you know, there's the stay at home moms, you know, on the playground, but then think about being the one, you know, man there. And so where we're dealing with the gender bias at, you know, at work, there's also a gender bias on the playground and, you know, at school too. I think it's a big part of that. Yeah. 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 It's the hardest part. The it hardest is, part is. Is, is that double. And some days you're not as great at every part of it as you'd like to be. And some days work gets a little bit, and some days mom gets a little bit, some days wife gets a little bit, because the coworker gets it. It's the hardest part. But if you do find your, your way to a supportive work environment, um, with colleagues that you respect and adore, I do. And a family that is the best. Our rule has always been family first, but um, it's the hardest part. I and mean, the family that is for me along the way is a big, big trick. Makes, makes it much easier to have it. I had two sons and was divorced, so I was a single mom for nine years. And it wasn't easy, but you do get a lot of support from your colleagues. And um, we had a very, very good daycare situation, so that was fine. My, I recall when my uh, older son was just a baby, I occasionally you have to bring a crib into the office because you know the daycare couldn't come or something like that. And Father Reichart was right next door to me, entomologist, but you know, and he said, oh, that's okay, just leave the door open. And if anything happens, I'll let you know. So I would go down to class. One day I came back and the kid wasn't there. <laughs> he, he had started crying. And of course, Father Riker had no idea what to do. So he went downstairs to the office and the secretarial staff came up. <laughs> but everybody kind of pitched in. And 
you know, it worked <laughs> out. Um, I got a call from my oldest son, who's now 43, uh, the other day. He said, you know, Mom, I'm really glad you brought us up the way you did, because we know how to deal with things as they come up. We don't get all thrown by, you know, COVID or whatever. And uh, I thought, great, okay, I guess I did a good, good job. <laughs> so there you are. So before we conclude, Dr. Teresa Ward, what you say? Cheers. I'll be very brief. Thank you. So most of you who know me know that I've spent my entire career in the biotech industry after graduate school. As I've started in Cambridge Maths um, from the mid-90s to 2000 for five years, and then I practiced IP law for biotech and biopharma clients, startup clients um, for almost 20 years. And then um, I just started at a, a new startup biotech company called Treeline um, that was founded less than a year ago. It's a former client who founded it, and I'm super excited. Um, but I have to say, and you know, Carrie was in tears up here talking about her modernity experience, but even watching from the sideline, I was in tears because I've been in this industry my whole life. And basically watching that company get to work, get it done in two years was probably the most elegant execution on science mission that I've ever seen, right? Like, so I hope there's a Netflix series that we can all binge watch. <laughs> you know, we have one of these students, female students out here playing Carrie in that series. <laughs> because I know I want to hear more about the story. Um, and, you know, I was in tears when I got my Moderna shot, not just because of you know, the pandemic, but because I was like, yes, I want a Moderna, not Pfizer. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> we, were to, we were naming our company. My CEO was like, Damn, I'm jealous of that name because it's such a cool name, right? Like modern <laughs> RNA. Like, you know, like branding is such a hard thing and it's just like such a perfect name. Um, so moving to this model for the 50th anniversary of women at PC, then now next, we see you know fabulous stories of then and just you know fabulous now. And the students here, you're our next, right? And you have a shining future, and we're all looking to you and we'll do anything to support you. Um, so in conclusion, again, I'd like to thank the panelists and the moderators here, uh, Father Shikar for your nice speech, um, the Development and Alumni Affairs Committee, who I work with frequently on this event, um, the Lavoie Lecture Committee, who helped plan all this and reach out to the panelists, um, and all the students for your time today. I know, you know, on a Friday afternoon, on a beautiful day like this, probably other things you'd like to do, but thank you again for your um, attendance here. And then, you know, your next is bright, just like the Veritas flame here at PC. So go make us proud. Thank you, everyone. Everyone is now all welcome to uh, continue this great conversation um, at the interactive.